Bem, muito boa tarde. Uh, em nome do Conselho Diretivo Regional Norte da Ordem dos Arquitetos, duas boas-vindas aos presentes. Uh, como sabem, nós estamos nesta, aqui reunidos à conferência do, do arquiteto Wayne Alter, uh, o qual agradecemos. Já tive o prazer de, de confraternizar e, e descobri que, afinal, também fui vice-presidente dos arquitetos do Ontário há umas mais décadas atrás. Agradecer, obviamente, ao João Gavião e à, à Passival, que é a organização aí deles, o apoio da secção regional. E sempre queria delongar muito, não deixo de querer, de querer deixar passar em claro de mais uma vez esta casa estar aberta para discutir a profissão, para refletirmos e nas suas várias facetas. Da mesma forma que falamos sobre uniformização de procedimentos com inquéritos ou do plano estratégico para a profissão para os próximos 20 anos pela, pela, pela região, também hoje estamos aqui reunidos para, em conjunto, poder ouvir o nosso colega, que veio diretamente do Canadá, para falar sobre arquitetura sustentável, arquitetura bioclimática e, sobretudo, poder partilhar conhecimento que é a grande função do Centro de Estudos Norte 41, do Projeto Norte 41, que foi, que foi a base conceptual de, que permitiu erigir esta casa, que é discutir a arquitetura, discutir a profissão, discutir o território, a criatividade e não, e não vamos esquecer a sustentabilidade. Por aqui eu fico, muito obrigado e deixo a apresentação. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want? Okay. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Uh, a partir de agora, se calhar comunicaríamos em inglês, okay, para deixarmos o Lloyd Alter sempre dentro da, da discussão. Um, so, I will just do a brief introduction. Um, this conference is called Uh, why we need a revolution in architecture and buildings. Um, we basically define the title and we put in the hands of Lloyd Alter, now you solve it, uh, you solve this problem. Um, but to start, uh, this presentation, um, this happened because Lloyd Alter came to our national Passive House Conference, which occurred yesterday in Aveiro, at Aveiro, and we want to maximize the presence of Lloyd in Portugal, so we try to spread his word um, as much as we can. So that's why we arranged a class in FAUP a, a few hours ago, and then we arranged this conference so that we can, like uh, Alexandre said, uh, share knowledge, share experience, um, and that's why we are here. Uh, the organization is by Ombrid and Passive <coughs> uh, with the support of uh, Ordens Architects, Section Regional North. Uh, one slide about uh, the, the Passive House movement in Portugal. It started uh, in 2012. We defined it with Passive House Institute the strategy to implement in Portugal first step uh, to build the first certified passive house in Portugal, second step monitor the performance, okay, because it was the first experience in a different climate, different country, we have to validate this, uh, this, uh, this approach. And then we were uh, obliged to create a national entity to spread the passive house uh, in Portugal. So, This was all done in November 2012. So it's a recent path, but we have already done a lot. And we, we say this in the most humble way. Okay? The Passive House uh, movement internationally. Uh, the headquarters are in Darmstadt, in Germany. They have a, a, a branch in Innsbruck, in Austria. And they communicate with the rest of the world through IFA, the International Passive Association, and that's where we are linked to this worldwide passive house sector. The other side of the organization, it's a own grid, it's a company. Uh, basically, we do 
everything we do is related to passive house. We do passive house projects, uh, passive house consultancy, passive house certification, passive house training. So this is basically what we do. Um, my brief presentation, I'm João Gavião, I'm an architect. I'm a, one of the founding members of Passive House Portugal Association and I work only and exclu ex exclusively uh, on the Passive House uh, theme, like trainer or a designer. Since 2013, when we started the activities of the association, we realized more than 40, uh, 46 events, um, seminars, workshops, uh, all over the country. <coughs> we uh, concluded yesterday the seventh Passive House conference. We reached more than uh, 1,800 uh, 1, participants. Uh, and one important uh, one important aspect of this uh, Passive House Network is the training. It, uh, are the professionals that are uh, certified to do the projects, the builders that are certified, certified to build Passive House. So this is what we have been trying to do, training. A lot of training because I feel that as an architect, when I leave the architectural school in 2008, I miss a lot of um, knowledge, of technical abilities, of understanding how the building um, works against the outdoor environment with the uh, interior, interior loads, the air that we breathe, the thermal surfaces that surround us. So this is something that uh, we lack uh, as students of architecture, as architects. And then, uh, related to architects and engineers, the Passive House Designers course, we try to uh, make, make available to everyone all the information. So at our website, passivehouse.pt, we try to um, show everything. So we have uh, a menu, solutions, where the part, Passive House partners show their solution so that you can see that we have everything that we need to build a passive house in Portugal. We don't have to um, import technology, equipment or knowledge. We have all what we need here um, and right now we count more than 100, 100 projects undergoing. Um, a lot of users residential, non-residential, office, hotels. Uh, <coughs> most of the cases for, um, how can I say, international uh, developers. They came from countries where the passive house has a more, um, how can I say, more presence in terms of dissemination and history also. And basically, just Two, two or three slides to explain what Passive House is about. Passive House is a, a standard, is a standard uh, that relies exclusively on performance. If we, if we reach the Passive House performance, we have a Passive House. No matter the color, the shape, um, but as designers we know how to optimize the global project to more easily and in a more cost-effective way reach this performance, okay? And the most important thing is a healthy uh, building, comfortable, energy efficient, economically accessible and obviously ecological. This is what Passive House is about in terms of performance goals. The presentation will be available for everyone, so... Uh, but we are talking about thermal comfort, uh, air quality, which is a, a cornerstone of the passive house. Uh, and this is something that Harvard University has already 
studied and compiled a lot of information in the studying the relation between the building sector, the buildings that we use to live, to work, and the health problems that we face because of using bad buildings, okay? And the passive house directly responds positively to seven of the nine foundations of an healthy building. Um, and this is very important to, to show what passive house can bring to the, the, the building uh, stock in Portugal. We can reduce drastically the energy consumption in buildings for heating and cooling, existing buildings, new buildings, and the next step, uh, if we have a passive house plus energy renewable, uh, we have a NSEP, an early zero energy building, which is mandatory for public buildings right now, 2021 for all other buildings. And the passive house opens, for, uh, opens our strategies for more possibilities. If we integrate the charging, uh, the energy storage, the energy management, and then if we also connect the electrical mobility, we are talking now about we are talking about now a microgrid. Okay, so this can be applied to one single building, to a neighborhood, to an entire uh, city. Okay, so this is pretty much the presentation, just to introduce the passive house and the organization. So it's up to you, Lloyd. Um, who hears, anybody here see my presentation yesterday? One. And you were in the room, but you couldn't see it. Yeah, because I was a, yeah, an industry player, so I was not able to, but I, that's why I'm here today. With your permission, I would like to run that presentation instead of the one I prepared for this because I know it better and it tells the more complete picture from our conversation before. Is that okay with you? Do you mind? No, go ahead. I was just before, I was working like mad just before thinking, oh, I've got to add this, I've got to add that. It's not clear, it's not good. And so. <laughs> This gives me... Uh, em português, para ser mais rápido, just one minute. Uh, a informação que vocês têm disponível, pronto, eu não pensei que isto é um desperdício de impressões e de papel. Isto aproveitámos da conferência de ontem, portanto estamos a dar novo uso àquilo que já foi produzido, ok? E depois, se não for utilizado, utilizamos como folha de rascunho. Okay. <risos> portanto, só, uh, basicamente, uh, aqui é um documento que não está aqui integralmente, tem só a introdução nas costas. Reivindicar a norma passival, se tem os acessos por QR Code do link. A checklist para verificar se estão perante o edifício passival, se tem o acesso depois ao documento online. O manifesto passival para todos, um documento de duas páginas que nós consideramos ser um documento estratégico para resolver muitos problemas do nosso país. E depois alguma informação sobre os próximos cursos que vamos ter. Portanto, ah, e, obviamente, uh, o crachá para vos trazer para a equipa de, dos passivistas. Já agora sobre a representação de hoje, que disse que está disponível. Uh, toda esta informação vai estar disponível. Está a ser gravada, vai estar disponível depois online, uh, depois, uh, ou, através da ordem ou diretamente, faremos chegar depois essa, os links para terem um acesso. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is such a beautiful building. I'm a past vice president of our local regulatory architects body in Ontario, Canada. And you've got a nicer building than we do. This is great. It's more solid. Um, I'm an architect who then became a real estate developer and then became an entrepreneur in trying to build prefabricated housing. And to sell the prefabricated housing, I started writing about it on the internet in about 2000, before there were blogs, updating it every day, because I thought new information would get out there. And before I knew it, I was enjoying writing a lot more than I was enjoying selling prefabs, and I was actually better at it. So uh, that led to getting hired by a, 
website devoted to sustainability, which led to me being hired by Ryerson University in Toronto to become uh, adjunct professor teaching sustainable design. And so that's, and during all my studying of that, I became really interested in the idea of Passive House and started going, getting invited to speak at Passive House conferences, which I've been doing for a number of years. So that's how I ended up here. I um, went to Portugal last year for the first time in person. Uh, I went over there and spoke at the conference last year and really enjoyed it and left and said, well, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep flying to conferences. It's uh, really bad for the environment and I'm talking about sustainability, so I shouldn't do it. But he kept asking and asking and asking and I said, okay, I'll come and fly again. And you know, why shouldn't I? I mean, Elon Musk is going to save us all with electric cars like his new pickup truck. All this technology is going to save us. We've been promised flying cars years ago when I was a kid, and they're actually building flying electric cars now. And Uber's gonna pick us up in flying taxis. The technology will save us. We were promised when my father was a kid, uh, you know, vacuum tubes with trains running through, and Elon Musk is gonna save us again with hyperloops that he's going to, like, shooting us at high speed. So why worry? Uh, we're being promised flying uh, self-autonomous -auto cars. And they're coming slowly with a few hitches, but they're coming, so they say. We were promised space stations, and we got space stations. And what we're even getting now in the States is what I call space stations on Earth. There's this standard called the Living Building Challenge. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's very, very tough and you have to do everything on site. You have to handle your own sewage, you have to take the water off the roof and purify your water, you have to make all your 120% of how much electricity you need. Uh, it's got composting toilets, it's wonderful, it's got everything, except it's like a spaceship. It's extremely expensive, it's extremely high maintenance, and it looks pretty much like the space station from above, just a sea of solar panels, and very expensive. And it doesn't scale, because as you go up, I mean, you don't have enough roof. They didn't have enough roof, so it just hangs out. And it really got me thinking that all of these visions of the technological future that all of the green architects are thinking about, and my favorite image, sort of bicycle highways in the sky, and everything is green and wonderful, and this is our future. Except it isn't, because we simply do not have the kind of time to have those kinds of dreams. It's a wonderful idea, but we just, as we know, as things happen all over, know that we've, we're in a different world, and we have to deal with the now. We have to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere now and all over the world, but particularly in Europe, you're seeing events like this, young people getting out and saying, fix this now. And we're the people who can do it. Um, Eric Holthouse, an American climatologist, sort of says, yes, we can save the koalas, we can save the world, but what would it require us to do? What kind of revolution would demand the required radical changes to make society, what would you have to do to fix it? A lot of architects in other countries, uh, most of the English-speaking countries now, but also Italy and a few others, have all signed this declaration, architects declare, engineers declare, for climate and biodiversity and urgency. And it's very nice program, you read the whole thing. And it says, you know, we believe in reducing carbon, we believe in doing this, we believe in doing that. And Lord Norman Foster is a person who signed that declare declaration, but it didn't stop him from last month signing, uh, announcing this new giant airport in the Red Sea that he's building. And a lot of people are saying, well, how can you sign the, uh, the architect's declare and then design airports? Isn't that a contradiction? And there's a big debate in Britain now. Should architects take contracts to design airports? And of course, every architect goes, yes, yes, give me an airport, give me an airport. Because who's going to turn that down? So we'll worry about that later. There will be electric airplanes. 
Now, I have four steps of, for radical, uh, radical uh, transformation of society, and the first is radical efficiency, and that's the passive house. But I'm not going to talk about the passive house because I did this for a passive house convention, and I was preaching to the converted. So you heard a bit about that before, and I'm not going to say much more about passive house. You can stay in one that Joe designed in Avero. This I stayed in last year. It's absolutely wonderful, and it's a tourist uh, uh, place. That you, it's beautiful. But the passive house for me is a very sensible idea. In Britain, when they were talking about net zero, you know, they said, let's take our normal leaky building and let's just keep adding solar panels onto the roof. And passive house says, well, you know, if you build a really good envelope, you can have a teeny battery and a teeny solar panel and it works much better. And that's all I'm gonna say about passive house. Um, what I'm going to talk about are the other three steps that are really important. And the first, probably the most important, is radical decarbonization of how we build the materials we use. Um, 20 years ago, this is a drawing from 25 years ago, nobody cared about carbon in building. If you built out of concrete, if you built out of steel, it was fine because the carbon involved in making all those materials was minor over time, nothing compared to the operating carbon released from heating and cooling the buildings. So who cared about what the building was made of? You worried about how much energy it was using. But what they found is the more efficient you made the building, oh, this has a pointer. How does it work? Do I just, I'm afraid I'll blow something up if no. I press the wrong button. Do you know how it works, the pointer? Okay. Oh, don't worry about it. No. Right, please. Okay. <laughs> you know, in the ordinary building, in the ordinary <coughs> building, the way we used to, the operating energy is blows it out in no time. But the more efficient the building got than the longer it took to where you get to almost passive house quality, and it's like 50 years between the operate before the operating energy is, is bigger than the embodied energy. But we, you know, don't have 50 years to talk about these things. We have to worry about the carbon that's going into the air now. And if you think about what happens, like if you build a bunch of buildings, the embodied carbon is fixed, but if you start now, but the operating carbon for all those buildings is going up and up and up and up, and if you're talking about just the t time to 2030 that we're worried about, the vast proportion of the carbon going into the atmosphere is coming from the materials we're building with and not from the operation of the building. And people say, well, let's build a better building, let's put in more insulation in that, but it depends what you use. Uh, uh, a, a, a scientist in Ontario, Canada, where I live, looked at what happened if you use plastic foam as insulation. You say, oh, we'll keep adding more foam. It's better, it's better. But plastic foam has a huge amount of carbon. It's made from fossil fuels. It's blown into foam with all of these greenhouse gases. So if you use the standard XPS that everybody uses, the blue foam finds that between now and 2050, there's all this insulation there, but the overall carbon involved in the building between operating and embodied is bigger than if you just built a crappy wood frame house according to the Ontario Building Code. By adding all of those wrong materials, it's actually a worse for the environment than just doing a leaky building with the standard code. And this was shocking to me. In fact, I'm still not entirely sure I believe it, but I've checked his numbers a couple of times. He just released this recently. But as people are saying, you know, we have to think about our whole lives about getting to this 1.5 degree lifestyle. And there's been a couple of studies being done about how we live on a 1.5 lifestyle. And this is why some architects say, oh, we're going to use 3D printing. We're going to have advanced materials. We're going to have autonomous construction. And there's a passive house architect I know in Colorado who said, you know, technology is not going to solve us. It's physics. 
It's how much heat goes through a wall at one rate. It's the physics of designing a building that are going to save us, not technology that we add on to it. You have more insulation of the right kind, you know the numbers, you do the math, and that's what Passive House is all about, doing the math. Now, the C40 people talking about what we have to do with buildings to really make them better by 2030. And there's their progressive target and their ambitious target. And the ambitious target, we really have to uh, reduce our cement by 56% steel and cement. We have to reduce the demand for new buildings. We have to build less if we don't really need it. We have to change to timber which uh, from residential, which I know is a big deal in Portugal. Everybody I talk to says, really? No, we don't want to build out of timber here. That may have to change. Um, we have to uh, replace cement with low carbon materials, and we have to recycle things more. And the funny thing is, is that everybody talks about, well, yes, because buildings are such a big proportion of everything, and sometimes you hear 50%, and sometimes you hear, like in this one, buildings are 19 or 20%. But look around, what do we do as architects and urban planners? What do we do? We, if we build our buildings, residential there, they're made of iron and steel and cement, almost all the iron and steel, and a big proportion of the cement that's not in the bridges. But that's another story, the bridges. Um, the power, the electricity, where is it going? It's almost all going into buildings. So already there, we're over half of the carbon, almost half of the carbon being emitted is in the buildings. But the thing is that I always say, and I go on about, you can't separate transportation from buildings. We get around, we drive the vehicles we need because of the way we design the buildings, or we live in suburbs, we built suburbs because we had cars. The transportation and building design are really two sides of the same thing. And what are we doing in all that transportation? We're mostly driving from building to building, from home to office, from home to store. Transportation is a direct reflection of what we do as urban designers. So if you take everything that we're doing as architects and designers and total it up, it's probably 75% of this pie. And that's a real problem, because we have to look at it all together. What happened? I just killed my presentation. <laughs> Did I hit the wrong button? <coughs> Maybe switch the, the screen. Uh, use a separate display. Oh, I have to go into play for that to happen. But now I have to go. Sorry. Now, the carbon we talked before about embodied carbon. And this report just came out last week in, at Greenbuild. It's a new tool that you can go, the EC3 tool, that you can go on and you can put your whole building into it. It's a giant uh, form that you put in all the aspects of your building and design and everything and you can find out what the embodied carbon of your building is. And this is one week old. I highly recommend you look at it. But embodied carbon is a funny word, a funny sentence. What does it really mean? In fact, I never understood it because the carbon's not embodied. If I say if this table is wood and low embodied carbon or this concrete is high embodied carbon, it doesn't mean the carbon's in it. Really what we're talking about is upfront carbon. The carbon that, as this architect Ellen Burrell said, that is burped or vomited or spiked out when the building is being built. It's upfront. And some British architects actually read what I wrote and said, he's right. And they brought out this report a couple of weeks ago where they used the word upfront carbon. And they divide the carbon in a building into a couple of different types. The embodied carbon is the whole thing. Upfront carbon is what I'm preoccupied with because of the time, which is the emissions from making the buildings. Use stage embodied carbon, which is you're doing repairs and you're bringing in more stuff and end of life. And all of those are uh, the embodied carbon, but this particular bit is the upfront. 
And the upfront carbon comes from the choice of the materials that we pick. So coal, cement is made 66% from coal, iron, iron and steel is 61%, aluminum is all electricity, so everybody thinks oh, aluminum is much better, and so those materials put out all that carbon. And I always thought concrete was the worst, but in fact, iron and steel is 24% of the emissions to 18% for cement. And the reason for iron and steel, I never knew this, was not just because they're heating it up to melt it, but in fact, the chemical reaction of making steel from iron ore, which is mostly iron oxide, means that they're throwing coal into that and the carbon from the coal combines with the oxygen in the hematite and puts out CO2. The chemistry of making the stuff actually emits carbon dioxide. The same in cement. The chemistry of putting the limestone into that rotary heater, which is heated by coal as well, the chemistry com means the carbon combines with the oxygen and it goes into the atmosphere. And so the process is generating CO2, just making the stuff. Not to mention all the problems of digging out all the aggregate and the rock and all the people I know in Toronto who have been hit and a couple who have been killed by these cement trucks racing around at high speed before the stuff hardens. Um, so everyone thinks, well, aluminum's great. Everybody recycles aluminum and it's 100% recyclable. Let's do everything out of aluminum. And in fact, when you look at the history of aluminum, it's always been a problem that once they, they designed, the, the whole aluminum production system was set up to build airplanes in uh, for the Second World War. And after the war, they built all these dams, they'd done all these things, they had all this capacity, and they, nobody knew what to do with it. Like, what do you do with aluminum? You build airplanes, right? That's all they knew about it, because until the war, it had been expensive stuff with limited use. So they actually had competitions in the 50s. I know someone whose father won one of these competitions. You have an idea for aluminum, we'll give you a prize. And so suddenly aluminum became the go-to material for throwaway single-use packaging all through the 50s. The aluminum can was invented, the TV dinner was invented to use up aluminum because they had all those dams and all that capacity and it was going to waste. Who needed electricity then for that? So now they make trucks out of aluminum, they make cars out of aluminum, and the demand for aluminum is so great that there is not enough recycled aluminum around. Even, it's only 20% of aluminum is recycled now, but even if it was 100%, it wouldn't be enough. And so all of the architects get told by the window frame manufacturers that, hey, we use recycled aluminum. Do you feel better about that? No, because you're creating demand for aluminum, which means more primary aluminum, which is one of the most destructive processes of industry that there are, from when you dig up the bauxite, from when you separate the bauxite, the alumina from the bauxite and leave this red mud, which sometimes those dams break, and you can see what happens when a forest gets flooded, and it then goes to these smelters where you think, oh, some of them, like in Iceland or in Canada, are all hydropowered, isn't that clean and wonderful, but again, chemistry. How do you make aluminum from alumina? You put a whole bunch of electricity between the carbon anode and the carbon cathode, and they combine to make, guess what, carbon dioxide. So even the wonderful water-fueled uh, green aluminum is making carbon dioxide. And they don't like what it's doing to the rivers either. So that's what you get to. You say, well, if we can't use that much aluminum, and we can't use that much steel, what's left? So the, there are a couple of things that we have to do to think about how are we going to build. If you want to think about reducing upfront carbon emissions, the first thing you do is you don't build stupid things that you don't need. Like this was going to be a 50-story high restaurant in a stick in London, a sort of lollipop restaurant in a stick, designed again by Norman Foster, that was revolving restaurants, classrooms, and <coughs> observation tower. Fortunately, this got killed. You don't, like uh, where I live in Toronto, make dumb decisions. The last mayor wanted to put transit out into all the suburbs <laughs> on trolleys like are so common in Europe. But we got this mayor, everybody's heard of Rob Ford, our cocaine, yeah. our cocaine uh, crazy drunken mayor that we had for four years. 
He hated trolleys because they got in the way of his car. He said, subways, subways, we want subways. Well, subways cost hundreds of times more, and they're all concrete. And so the change from this to the concrete tube had a huge impact, a huge cost. I'll be paying it for my taxes for the rest of my life. You don't tear down perfectly good buildings. This is uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's former offices in New York. It's a 60-story building. If you go on the J.P. Morgan site, you'll see a whole section on sustainability. What are they doing here? They're knocking down a 60-story building. By the way, the first major building in North America designed by a woman architect. A uh, very important building historically and architecturally. And they're replacing it with an 80-story building. So, you know, taking down 60 stores, fine. The 20 stories on top is new. They've got to rebuild the 60. That's the embodied entered carbon of that. The upfront carbon of that is insane. And you have to start thinking about using different materials. Wood is actually turning out to be one of the best ones. It's not perfect, but trees, when they grow, they don't put out carbon dioxide. They absorb it and put out oxygen. When you cut them down, and if you do it sustainably, if you do it properly, the trees grow, you turn it into building materials, and you store that carbon forever. And then you plant new trees, like they've been doing in Austria for hundreds of years, there's not an original tree in the whole country because they've been building wood frame and timber stuff for so long, and they invented this stuff, uh, you can, if it's properly done and properly managed, you can build buildings that do not have a seriously big upfront carbon footprint. And there are lots of other materials that are good. This is my favorite building to show, which is the uh, East, in East University of East Anglia, done by Archetype Architects. And this building is, almost is made entirely of natural materials. It's a high fiber diet. You could chop it up and put milk on it and eat it for breakfast, all the straw and all the stuff in it, all natural high fiber wood materials. They even took traditional thatch and put it on the root on the sides of the building. And this is the palette of the natural materials they built the building out of. And this is what was, until I think very recently, the largest cross-laminated timber building in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is the largest one in North America, in Minneapolis. This is one I visited in Toronto, or first in Canada under construction. This is the tallest in the world right now. In Norway, they cheated by doing that wood framework on top. Really the tallest one is this one in uh, British Columbia, Canada, if you don't cheat. Um, and this is the crazy new stuff that they're building with Thomas Heatherwick, the English architect, uh, in Toronto for Google. In Sweden, they've developed incredible robotic technology so they can take stick framing, which has a bad reputation for leaky walls, and make them really precise and really terrific and do a lot of housing out of that. And this is the kind of stuff that they're doing. And then there's my favorite building material, yours, cork. Last year after I spoke, I went out to the uh, cork, the factory where they make cork, and learned about this incredible material that every nine years they cut off the tree, they just put it together with steam and a press and turn it into these blocks, they run through a saw, they built a little house 15 years ago to demonstrate its possibilities, and it's just a lovely little thing. And you say, wow, could you really build a building out of cork? And in fact, yes, you can. This is Cork House that came in a runner-up for the Sterling Prize and the best building in the United Kingdom. And it's a lovely thing built entirely out of Amarim's cork and it's just got this warmth inside of it, and this smell from the cork. It's a marvelous thing, and it's all designed that they can take it apart and rebuild it somewhere else. And it's very expensive. I wish you would plant more trees and make more cork, but um, this show that I was at, there was a man there who said, I'm building this house and I'm insulating it with cork. So, it's expensive. He said, actually, they said it's no more expensive than rock wool. You would know that true. Would you say that's true? Yeah. At the moment, it's a little bit expensive to work with cork. Yeah. 
still uh, there are some ways not so friendly uh, to lower the port that lowers the price still it's not so a compat he has a competitive product <laughs> <laughs> Very nice competitor. I'm, I'm joining Cork uh, in our products right now. And oh. I, I'm being demanded by, by something with Cork more and more. So at the moment, I work with XPS, uh, with no Google, and all that. No, no, no. XPS. <laughs> uh, well, I have had a, a lot of people demanding nowadays to mix the XPS with uh, Cork more and more. Huh. And, uh, okay. I'm not a fan of XPS, as I've said, but there you go. So. The next thing, the next two are that I think is where we get serious about changing the way we think about design. We've had radical efficiency, radical decarbonization. We have to get to radical simplicity, rethink how we design. Passive house, a lot of people say, you know, it's too expensive and that, but that's because everybody makes everything so complicated. Now, a lot of what I was thinking, I was going to throw up my whole presentation after I went to the new museum, the museum of, what is it properly, what's it called? M-A-A-T, what are those? Uh, architecture and Architecture and Yes, yeah, Architecture and museum. Technology. And in the old turbine area where they had made, uh, had a coal, it was a generating plant before, there was this incredible exhibition on economy of means, which in English is, its usual meaning is to, to, uh, oh, read it in Portuguese, third line. Uh, use as little material as possible to do as much as possible. And my professor in architecture school always used this term, economy of means, generosity of ends. Use as little as possible to get as much as possible and you've designed a good building. They don't have the gener generosity of ends here, but the economy of means, wonderful show. If you can get to Lisbon before the end of January, you really should see it. In America, this is everybody's fantasy of the house they want to live in, and it's got gables and gables on what the passive house people call thermal bridges, where all that heat is leaking out, and you know, you look at this, and there are corners everywhere, and all kinds of places that just make these things impossible to heat, and they're all built really badly out of stick frames, and the wind blows through them. They're awful things. And this is what people want in the big loft, drive their car, their big SUV up, and this is American life. Passive house, again, the, the simpler it is, the better it is. I'm gonna ask you to come in again and just define a thermal bridge in 30 seconds in Portuguese, because it's too technical, I don't think. You did a great job this afternoon. In Portuguese? In yes, in Portuguese, it'll be faster. <laughs> Uma ponte térmica, basicamente, é uma perda adicional de calor uh, ao longo de uma extensão. Pode ser em metros ou em metros quadrados. Okay? Portanto, é uma perda adicional de calor para além das, das perdas de calor que já existem pelos componentes homogéneos. E, normalmente, quando temos estruturas ou projetos mais complexos, estamos a maximizar o potencial para aparecerem pontes térmicas, que depois é onde vão estar a, a grande parte da origem dos problemas da nossa construção. E em termos de patologias, uh, sobretudo patologias e perdas adicionais de calor, desconforto, etc. So that's why these architects who do these highly efficient buildings in colder climates make them so simple, because every time you do a job, you get a problem. And an English engineer called it, and I took it, learned this from him, he called it radical simplicity. And everyone looked, and what, I, what he said, what Nick would say is, you know, you start from day one and you design the building properly, knowing what your end result, what you want is. And he used the term value engineering. I don't know if you used the term, but when I was an architect, it was the worst two words in the English language. It means, here comes a consultant, he's going to tear everything nice off your building to lower the cost. But what Nick says is you start right at the beginning, and you don't put the stuff that doesn't work that well up front. You don't put anything there for the consultant to take off. So, you know, how do you make the building simpler and easier to build and cheaper to build? Design from the inside out. Uh, window size, shape, position, and everything. But 
That's not how the way architects are thinking now. Now architects are thinking big, like Bjork. And Bjork, when he comes and does a building, it's not simple. I went and saw this building in Vancouver when I was uh, speaking at a Passive House conference there. And I couldn't believe how every single unit was had a roof, had a floor, had all of this. These are vacuum panels. This is very expensive stuff. It may be a relatively efficient building, but when I was a real estate developer, after I was an architect, I know every time you have a roof over a living room, you've got a leak. You do something like that coming up the stairs here, you've got a leak. Roofs leak. You try and minimize them. And here, every single unit is a, a and I just think, what are they thinking? <coughs> But if you go to Munich, where they have really strict building codes and everything has got to be almost a passive house design standards, they learn really quickly. You do simpler forms and you work on proportion. You work on making it look good uh, by having a good eye. I mean, these are just dumb boxes, to use the phrase. And the windows make it look, I think, not bad. But we have to change our perception of what aesthetics are. I mean, I first saw this passive house in Philadelphia, and I thought, ew, that's really ugly. But then when you go on the streets of Philadelphia, you find all the old 100-year-old buildings are exactly the same. They're sort of plain with punched windows. Or this building I went to see in Berlin, which I just loved which was a cooperative housing building. All the people got together and had a competition to find the architect. And basically, it's a box. And the only decorative element on it are these balconies that are clipped on the outside and covered with the cheapest, what do you call it? We call it frost fence, industrial fencing in North America for the balconies. And I just think it's gorgeous. And this one also in Munich that is basically a dumb box with punched windows, but they built a sort of exoskeleton, a surface on top of it that is the circulation and the stairs and hung the balconies on it. So the building is really thermally efficient, it's passive house, but they put all the stuff on the outside. And they, it's a simple box with decoration. The finest, final one, the final of the four radical moves is what I call radical sufficiency. And that's, I, I don't know if that word is understood clearly or translate, but it means, you know, what is enough? In New Zealand, they're having a marketing campaign to tell people to use less. And they use the math symbol. So they say, say yes to less. Less is more. Get more out of less. And that's the campaign. Now, in America, there's Elon Musk again, and Elon Musk is talking about the future we want. And what is the future that Elon Musk thinks we want? We want a big suburban house on a big lot. We want a solar roof with his new solar tiles. We want Tesla R2 in the garage, and we want a big battery pack on the wall. So isn't this green and wonderful? But you need a lot of money to buy those Teslas and those 40,000 euro roofs and the battery packs and all of that. You need a lot of land, you've got a lot of sprawl. It doesn't exactly scale for a lot of people, but this is sort of the American dream. And again, what I was saying before about land use and transportation being the same coin, as one consultant, Jared Walker, smart guy said, really, they're the same thing, uh, in two different languages, but you can't have that kind of, you, can't, you need that kind of car to live in that kind of house. And uh, so that's the problem with them, and the problem with them is that in every one of those cars, there's a lot of steel, there's a lot of aluminum, and there's a lot of upfront carbon. There's in fact more upfront carbon because of the batteries in the blue here than in a regular car. So if you imagine, oh, we're going to transform the millions and millions of cars to electric cars, and that's going to solve our problem because they're electric, you just have to total up the carbon involved, the upfront carbon of making them all. And I did the math, and I thought, a slide, where's that slide? I couldn't find it, but it was extraordinary. 
the embodied emissions of a car typically, in fact, rival the pipe emissions over its life. With an electric car, the embodied emissions are like 100% of the carbon. Not to mention the carbon that goes into making the highways and the congestion that you get with the cars. And everyone thinks, oh, again, these self-driving cars will save us. But in fact, what you've got, you've got the same picture, whether they're gasoline cars, whether they're electric cars, whether they're autonomous cars, or whether they're Uber cars. It's the same picture. Which is why I say we can't separate transportation and, and uh, from our building design. It all goes together. I am a bicycle rider year-round in Canada. Uh, I've been doing it since I started teaching sustainable design. Because I said, guys, if you're thinking about sustainability, you can't be driving a car in the city. And talk about the benefits of it. You can point to Copenhagen and say all the wonderful things they do there, how 50% of the properties of the people in Copenhagen get around by bicycle, and another 30% get around by transit, and almost nobody drives. And right now, we're in the middle of a new transportation revolution that we have to think about how it changes our designs. Uh, right now, we've got the e-mobility, the new kinds of little things that are coming around. Six months ago, I bought this Dutch e-bike. Um, you know, that's the big Toronto highway on top of it that brings all the cars in. And I have not driven my car in this, my family car, it's my wife's car now, for six months because I use the e-bike for everything. Last week I got new tires with carbide studs on them so I can go on the ice uh, and not break my neck on the ice this winter. I don't think you have that problem here. And seeing the hills that you have here, I bet an e-bike would be a nice thing to have. Um, in fact, in Europe, it's huge right now what's happening. Everybody said, oh, electric cars are going to take over the world. Electric cars, as you can see, are just barely going up, and e-bikes are going off like a rocket. And everybody's using this kind of stuff. It's not just kids. It's like uh, this guy I saw in Paris last year. I saw these in Lisbon last year, and some that didn't work so well, the police didn't like. Uh, the other day, I went from the museum uh, which is quite a distance from downtown, and I got in one of those uh, Uber scooters, those Uber scooters, and I went all the way back to the center of town. You're going to have to think about repaving Lisbon because my teeth were rattling out and I was getting a headache just trying to ride with those tiny tires on the, those tiles. We did, I did eventually reach the bike rack, and you could finally relax and go there. But honestly, this stuff, I know it's a Lisbon tradition, <laughs> but it doesn't work with these kinds of things. Uh, in Taiwan, they developed this because so many people live in apartments and they said, well, if I've got an electric something, how can I possibly charge it? And so they have these Gogoro ones, which now the battery is a service. You own the scooter and you just keep changing the battery, swap and go. And it's a wonderful system that's let thousands of people who live in apartments actually deal with the problem of how they do this. Now I'm ending.